Kyle Sondland and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Security Token Show, episode 116. My name is Kyle Sondland. I'm your host, joined with my co-host and business partner, Herwig Konings. And we're here in sunny Miami, Florida, as always. And we've got a rock star episode for you today. But before we dive into that, I did want to let you know that the STM crowdfund has been blowing up. As you may remember, we are doing a testing the waters campaign for a security token offering for the business, and we have officially crossed the $3 million pledge mark. Ooh. Over 500 investors, Herwig. Kyle. Unbelievable response. We've three times oversubscribed our goal, and we're not stopping there. So check the link in the bio anywhere that you can find it on any of our channels, or you can go to our website, stlmarket.com, and find the link to more information on the deal. Now, for the rest of the show, we got a great, great lineup. We've got the industry news with Jessica. We've got John's STO updates, Keith's secondary trading activity update, and, of course, Eve's metaverse news. And then, of course, a main topic today, Kyle, bankrolling lawsuits with security tokens, of course. It's going to be a good one, I think. But, of course, we've got the top five things that you need to know, Kyle. What's number one? Number one is Exodus. Exodus is a cryptocurrency wallet. We've covered them many times in the past. Why? Because they did a $75 million Reg A plus sold equity in their company that now trades on T0. And so Exodus has done something interesting in announcing they are doing a $2 million share buyback of those liquid tokens. So the price has been kind of going up and down as the liquidity rate has been pretty mixed in terms of the depth. And so because of that, they're actually going to be buying back up to $2 million in shares and up to $55 a share on a, on a per share value. So this is a, a very interesting method of providing some additional liquidity for their trading asset. Indeed, Kyle. In fact, JP Richards and the CEO said that actually he believes in the treasury's expansion of the company and the so forth growth in the industry and their revenue is the reason why they're so confident confident in the company and why they're making the repurchase. 150 million in liquid assets too, by the way. No joke. Number two, Tokeny is helping out a company called Enegra move their security token from Ethereum to Polygon. Now, Polygon is a more lesser known security token blockchain, but here we are seeing a 28 billion dollar company move its security token over so that is definitely no small feat there and that's a peer-to-peer -to -peer traded token supposedly so who knows what kind of activity is going on there but definitely goes to show you in fact the ceo of tokeny luke flemplin he actually said that uh, the reason for this is to show also that you can save on transactions fees compared to a blockchain like ethereum and specifically security tokens they're not tied to any specific blockchain upon issuance clearly this move shows Shows that you can move to a different blockchain without a huge problem. If a $28 billion company out of Malaysia can do it, so can you. Multi-chain assets are the future. Moving into number three, we've got the Connecticut jury, which came out and found that a specific set of crypto products are not securities. And this is the first U.S case law that actually sets precedent on whether a crypto asset is or is not a security. We've talked about how the SEC can has the Howey test and some of these other tests that they use to try to determine whether an asset or an investment is a security or if it's something else. And this is the first case in which we've seen crypto falling into the commodity standpoint. The jury found that the tokens offered provided value that was actively rewarded to those shareholders as opposed to passive income. And because of that, they did not see it as a security. That's big, big news. Definitely something worth diving into another time. Moving on to number four, we've got some more legislative requests from the government, this time from the U.S. Treasury Department and from President Joe Biden himself, calling for legislation around stable coins and CBDCs. You know, specifically stable coins, there's billions of dollars now in tokenized digital dollars that are being used all around in this economy, in this digital economy. And now it looks like Congress and the White House, they both, and the U.S. Treasury Department have all now called for the legislation. <laughs> and 
But on top of it off, the SEC wants to govern all of it and regulate it. So we'll see where all of this goes because certainly this is heating for some kind of action. In mm -hmm. fact, we've noted that the central bank digital currency launched in China previously. It now has over 140 million e <sighs> accounts registered in just something over like a year and a half. That's crazy. That's almost half the population of the U.S. That, yeah, it's just going to force the hand of regulators here inside of the country. We'll have to see what's happening. We'll keep you updated here first. And number five, to close out our top five, we've got Thailand. The oldest bank in Thailand, SCP, paid 536 million U.S. dollars for a 51% stake in the largest cryptocurrency exchange in Thailand known as BitCube. So this is a big deal. An institutional bank, certainly the largest in Thailand, getting involved in the crypto space. They see the writing on the wall. That's the old guard moving into the new world. I love to see it. Now let's get on to the rest of the industry news with Jessica. Hi, I'm Jessica Burns, and I'm back with this week's industry updates. Starting off, we have Avalanche Foundation, which has launched a new fund dedicated to the development of the Avalanche blockchain ecosystem. Called Blizzard, the fund is composed of contributions from Avalanche, the Avalanche Foundation and investors in Avalanche's latest $230 million capital raise. The new fund builds on top of Avalanche's $180 million DeFi incentive program. Avalanche Rush, announced on August 18th, since then, the number of transactions on the network has gone up a little over 4 million to 18.5 million. According to analytics tool Avalanche Explorer, the Avalanche's AVAX token has tripled in price from $21 to $63. Blizzard is the latest example in the growing trend of nine-figured incentive programs by blockchain teams to bootstrap growth. It is primarily focused on four areas, DeFi, enterprise applications, NFTs, and culture applications encompassing social tokens and gaming, and could also be used for other initiatives such as security token issuance and development of digital identities. Cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase is now allowing customers to borrow as much as 40% of their Bitcoin value up to $1 million with no credit checks, the company announced this week. They also accounted the borrowing minimum and maximum will vary by state, and the loans will be issued at an annual rate of 8%, and borrowers won't be able or won't be required to show credit checks. They will need to make a minimum of $10 monthly interest payments and flexible prepayment schedules. We also saw that MasterCard is preparing for its infrastructure with the deployment of CBDCs. The world's third largest payment processor has taken a keen interest in the cryptocurrency space in recent months. The company has not only seen sizable volume growth in their consumers using MasterCards to purchase crypto, but has also secured several partnerships with cryptocurrency firms. But the company's most ambitious viewpoint emerged during a discussion regarding central bank digital currencies or CBDCs saying that the most likely chance for this kind of technology to work for payments is if it's issued through a government in form of a CBDC. For so long, if you wanted to invest in music, you needed to fork over millions to purchase an artist's catalog to reap the rewards of getting paid every time a song is played. But two EDM artists are changing that and making investing in music accessible to everybody using blockchain technology. The duo is launching a platform called Royal, which will sell rights to songs through NFTs, and the objective is to give fans a chance to earn money alongside their favorite artists while disrupting how music is owned. Before NFTs investing in music, publishing rights was virtually impossible. You had to have millions of dollars limiting investors to mostly music labels, head funds, and accredited investors, individuals with a net worth of more than a million dollars. It meant buying a catalog of an established artist like Tina Turner, who had just sold her catalog for $50 million. Now, with platforms like Royal and NFTs, people can invest in individual songs rather than an entire album or even fractions of a song. Royal will divide portions of a song's royalties into fractions and sell them as NFTs, making it much more affordable for everyday investors. Back in the security token office, Peter Gaffney is at it again this week talking about tokenized metaverse investments in week 39 of Tokenize This. You can find this article and more on the security token market website. That's all I've got for you today. Now let's head over to John for the latest STO and market updates. Welcome to another lovely edition of your weekly STO updates. I'm John Pitt, the token boy. And let's go ahead and dive right in. First up, we have a company whose main business model includes institutional and retail NFT sales. The company, Millennium Fine Art, is conducting an STO public sale that opens on November 8th. The token is called the MS token and the MS standing for Millennium Sapphire, which is also the asset being tokenized. 
The Millennium Sapphire is a natural sapphire that was carved as a tribute to the creative genius of humanity and is valued at over $150 million. The MS token represents both fractionalized ownership and pro rata share in the revenue driven by the NFTs. Now, there are over 134 scenes, each representing the high points in human civilization over the past 5,000 years that are carved on this Millennium Sapphire. These carvings form the inspiration of MS Tokens NFT productions. The plan is a total of 150 million tokens will be minted and made available at an SEO price of $3.50 per token. The offering will be conducted through Regulation S and Regulation D, meaning international and accredited U.S. investors are allowed to participate. The token will be traded on Crypto SX Exchange and it will be powered by the blockchain Ravencoin. The registration is limited to the first 2,500 applicants on a first come, first serve basis. Now the company expects this registration process to fill up within minutes and the sale is expected to close by November 23rd or even before then. Next up, we have a hemp company using tokens to crowdfund a lawsuit. This is a new way of raising capital and it's called litigation financing. The company is called Apotheo and is an agricultural research institution focused on the commercialization of hemp. They are currently in a lawsuit against Kern County for damages arising from alleged wrongful destruction. The company is estimating the loss of hemp crops to be worth between $500 million to $1 billion at the time of the destruction. Apothea is seeking to raise its capital as a way to ease the burden of litigation. The offering's goal is to raise $5 million, and as, as of November 1st, they've already raised $220,000 from 120 investors. If the lawsuit is successful, investors, they have a chance to get a multiplier based on the amount of tokens they hold and the time taken to resolve the lawsuit. Now, on the flip side, investors run the risk of losing 20% of their investment if the case is dismissed. Moving on, it wouldn't be an STO update without an update on our very own STO. Here at Security Token Market, we take pride in our community. That same community has provided us with over $3 million pledge from over 500 investors. We have to thank you guys for all the love. And if you haven't reserved a spot, please do so. Click the link in whatever bio you're watching this show on. Finally, just in case you missed my weekly blog, The Token Board Journal, then make sure you check that out. Last week, I covered the controversial rug pool with Squid Game's crypto coin. The creator stole over $3 million from investors. I also highlighted why I believe security tokens to be a more useful and safer alternative investment than some sketchy crypto investments. Well, the new journal is dropping out this Thursday, so tune in. That's it for me on the keep with our market update, and I'll catch you on the other side of the blockchain. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to yet another weekly secondary market trading segment. As always, all news and pricing data is sourced from stlmarket.com. Today, the total security token market cap is at about $1.16 billion. That's a rise of about 1.75% from $1.14 billion last time around. We have some exciting news this week from our friends over at TreeBR. The world's first blockchain-based carbon offset is now listed on a global stock exchange. According to the press release, Tree is a preferred equity security that, on a one-to-one -one basis, represents one ton of carbon offset, equivalent to a carbon credit. Tree is a retirable voluntary carbon credit listed on Merge, a global stock exchange where proceeds go directly to the Amazon rainforest landowners. The security will be issued in the form of a digital security on the Liquid Network, an L2 for Bitcoin, and providing a per permanent record of ownership and retirement. This is a huge development that we will surely be keeping you updated on for the next coming weeks and months. T0 and their security token TZROP is taking a bit of a hit this week. It was sitting at around $5 flat last week and is now down to $3.96 at the time of recording. That's a sharp decline of over 20%. With that said, weekly trading volume is actually up this week 20%. It's at 1.8 million from 1.5 million the week prior. We've been reporting on the massive gains that Mount Pelerin has been seeing over the past few weeks. Today, the MPS token is sitting at $8.64 from $7.58 last week. That's yet another 13% gain. Weekly trading volume is at $151,000 for the week, which is an increase of almost 18%. Overstock, OSTKO, continues its move to the upside yet again this week. The token is sitting at $83 from $77 at the time of recording last week. That's another 7.7% gain in price for the token. Weekly trading volume has officially exploded now. It's sitting at $4.2 million this week, which is a 68% rise from the $2.5 million in weekly trading volume last time around. 
The INX token is bouncing around in a range. It's back up to 265 this week from a tie of 250 last week. That's a 6% rise in price. While weekly trading volume has remained unchanged for the past two weeks, it's still at $2.5 million. Indecision around the price of the INX token paired with the rising volume and price for overstock is making it easier for the OSTKO token to pull away as the number one security token with a market cap of $364 million compared to INX's $327 million this week. Exodus is continuing its recovery this time around. It reached up to $20 from $17 last week and $14 a week before that. Weekly trading volume is back up a bit from its slide last week. 7% is sitting at $212,000 from $198,000 last time around. Video Network's RST is cooling off a bit from its recent run-up in price. This week, the token is sitting at $3.12 from $3.16 last week. Weekly tra trading volume got a big boost this week. It's sitting at $547,000 from $262,000 last time. That's a rise of 108%. Moving into our section on tokenized stocks for the week, we have Grayscale. Tokenized shares pulling back slightly in volume. It's at $52 million for the week, down 13% from $60 million last week. Although there was a slight pullback this week, the trading volume is still significantly higher than the $12 million figure posted on FTX just a few weeks back. Weekly trading volume continues to rise for Tesla tokenized shares. This week, we're at $21 million, a 16% increase from $18 million last week. Alibaba tokenized shares also going up in volume on FTX. This week, the tokenized stock reached weekly trading volumes of $7.3 million, a rise of 28% from $5.7 million last time around. FTX continues to prove increasing demand for tokenized stock trading with yet another incredible week of performance. With that said, it's been a fun week in the markets. And as always, do your own research and hit me up on Twitter at KeithDLT to send me all of your hot takes. See you next week. Wait, wait, you. Welcome to Inside the Metaverse with your host, Eve Bangholm. We go over the top breaking news relating to the metaverse weekly. I'd like to start off with, you know, McDonald's. They're entering the NFT market with something that, you know, we all grew up already waiting for, which is a McRib NFT. The NFT kind of flips around like a Pokemon card, having like really cool graphics. Even, they were even giving it away. They were giving it away to anybody who retweeted their post on Twitter. So it may not be too late for that. So check it out. This is cool because it shows support from yet another major company into the NFT boom. Here comes the metaverse, baby. I wonder what the future is going to hold for this NFT, because as you know, we're embarking on the metaverse and seeds are being planted. Excited to see what the future holds. Let's go. Next, Nike is getting into the metaverse. About time. I love this because because Nike, as you know, is a strong brand. And this strong brand has filed seven trademark applications as it prepares to enter the metaverse. Are we going to see decked out Nike shoes in Decentraland and Sandbox? Maybe so. Or maybe they might be the first brand to really integrate with multiple games and cross-chain platforms and integrating mainstream with blockchain gaming. Next up, we got Engine announcing a $100 million fund to help build the metaverse. Engine, as you know, is the GOAT in the land of interoperability. They want to develop NFT assets, digital collectible applications, gaming harnesses, mixed reality, virtual events, and build the multi-chain infrastructure. The metaverse really needs interoperability, and I think that Engine is the one to do it. Next, Microsoft is jumping into the metaverse with this thing called Mesh. You know, they're opening up with a couple videos, a couple articles about their vision to integrate the metaverse to help people collaborate better. Kind of sounds like meta, but you know, they are already embarking on their vision. Wanting to integrate with Microsoft Teams to make meetings less boring. Let's see what that looks like. That was Inside the Metaverse with your host, Eve Banco. And kicking off the main topic of Security Token Show, episode 116 on litigation finance. We want to dive into this main topic, but before we get into the main meat of this topic, we want to cover the companies of the week. This is a segment where we get to pick our two favorite companies, the ones that made the biggest moves in the space. Herwig, give the award out. Who do you got for this week? 
Well, I have to give it to our number one piece of news, actually, Exodus. You know, making a big deal, I thought, Kyle, with that huge repurchase announcement. I think it's one of the first of its kind that we've seen in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a powerful move, I think. It's a statement and a testament when the CEO and the company approves a treasury purchase to go ahead and go go ahead and you know repurchase their shares. That means the company is confident in their growth. It means they have the treasury to do this. And it also usually means gains for the investors, which is, in fact, what we saw. So for making this move, I have to give my company of the week to Exodus, Kyle. I think that's a great choice. The shares were up $4 on this announcement on only a $20 per share you know, stock. So, I mean, it's definitely awesome gains. And then on top of that, as you mentioned, I mean, considering they did the Reg A Plus, what, six months ago, they essentially sold those shares at 27, bought them right back at the 20 range. So free shares, free cash, it makes a lot of sense and investors are happy. Congratulations. Now, what do you got, Kyle? So, my company of the week this week is Infinite Acquisition. Now, Kevin Durant is an NBA basketball player. He's had a cr incredible success investing through his venture portfolio known as 35 Ventures, one of those being an early backer in Coinbase, which is one of the more successful investments in the, the 21st century. And in so, the crypto space. And, specifically. Yeah, specifically in the crypto space. And he's not done there. He's actually going to be taking an Infinite Acquisition, which is a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company company is going to be acquiring into the crypto and fintech space looking for a business. They've already raised $200 million and are looking to acquire shares in one of these large companies to be able to bring that onto the public markets through NASDAQ. So this deal was underwritten wow. by Credit Suisse and they're getting involved in the crypto space. There's going to be another publicly traded crypto company. Kevin Durant, man, doing SPACs on Wall Street with Credit Suisse into crypto companies. Super <laughs> cool. Crazy. That's a great choice. Very Kyle. Awesome world we live in. So moving into the main topic, Herbert, how about you kick it off? Let's talk a little bit about litigation finance with security tokens. Litigation finance. How many of you have heard that term before? We're talking about, as we so aptly put it, bankrolling lawsuits, right? So this is the idea, the concept that you need to actually finance cases. You know, lawsuits need money in order to get done. And at the end of the lawsuit, there is a potential result, a failure, where of course there is no gains, but on the other hand, there is a successful claim. There could be a huge, huge reward to pay out to specifically, of course, the plaintiff, as well as the investors in this case. So this is actually an investment contract essentially to finance a lawsuit in order to keep going. I mean, Kyle, if you think about it, a lawsuit takes a lot of expenses. You've got your attorneys, of course, especially good ones. They don't charge just doing it on commission. They have a team that helps them and they need to operate. But then you've got a lot of other hidden costs that you might not have thought about. You've got, of course, you know, discovery where you're tracking down people and you're hosting them and you want to do interviews with them. That all time costs money, of course. You've got, of course, your expert witnesses, which charge, you know, good fees in order to go ahead and provide and help you with testaments travels and operational budget trial fees if you get to it there's all this other stuff that a, a trial or a case in this case a lawsuit might need in order from a financing perspective so it is a little bit like a business it is a little bit like an investment opportunity yeah absolutely especially considering the more money you can dedicate the more hands on deck the more likely you actually may win that case so it's actually the bigger the payout and the bigger the payout so you know, essentially what we see is there's an estimated 50 to 100 percent return for the existing market so there's actually an existing market of private investors that do fund these deals. An estimated 40 funders that have put nearly $10 billion wow. into financing litigations and two and a half billion, in fact, in just the last 12 months alone. So this industry is growing because of, as I mentioned, a 50 to 100% potential return on these investments year over year. That's absolutely astronomical and, and investors around the world would want to get access to that. That means that there's not enough capital in this opportunity for where the returns are justifying. So this is a fascinating opportunity. Absolutely. Investors around the world, you say, Kyle? Well, this sounds like a security token opportunity to me. In fact, if you've been watching John's segment, you may have heard of Liddy Finance. So they are actually a blockchain company out of Singapore, or no, Switzerland, sorry, enabling the technology for investors to be able to go ahead and go ahead and you know, get security tokens mm -hmm. that represent litigation finance. So that's a super cool opportunity. It means you have a security token today and actually they're doing a lot. You can stake it. You can go ahead and of course trade it. I mean, they're enabling a host of new opportunities for this incredibly new asset class. So let's talk about some of the benefits around potentially tokenizing what this deal looks like. So first off, the idea that you could take multiple different legal claims and put them into one asset that diversifies the risk of any one of those legal cases. 
cases, right? Because as you mentioned, any one legal case could just fail and you lose all of your money and that just sometimes happens. That's, that's the nature of lawsuits. So if you could put more than just one suit into a specific asset investors could get access to, that allows them to diversify that risk over a basket or set of these different litigation contracts, um, which is what they end up becoming, which allows you to diversify that risk, as well as reducing the cost because of the fact that you're kind of combining it across multiple deals. So those are two really great examples. Absolutely. So that's what we call a litigation finance fund, right? This idea to get exposure to a number of different cases. So you have to make your decision. Do you want to find somebody who knows what they're doing and is picking specific cases to back or do you find one big meaty case to get behind and that's the interesting thing about I think this asset class is it's one that you can kind of invest with your heart a little bit it's you know you can actually go in in some cases and see which specific cases there are other platforms out there like Lex shares and other funds and things like that that kind of have a narrative or a thesis about what they're backing in some cases opportunity to help the little guy right it's the fact that they don't have the finances in place to pursue their lawsuit but with your help they actually might be able to win their case uh, so I think this is, does offer an interesting way for people to invest in you know you know diversifying their portfolio in the first place yeah I think I've seen you know you see GoFundMe sometimes of people trying to raise for for legal coverage maybe in a medical malpractice case or something along those lines and now you actually are incentivizing those investors to actually give you even more than just kind of out of the goodness of their heart obviously you you, know, you like to get people that are investing in the right causes, but giving those people a, some kind of economic incentive also allows more capital to flow into the campaign and makes it maybe even more realistic that that lawsuit could get funded and the resources that are, are there are prepared properly. And last but not least, Kyle, I do think it's worth mentioning that there are sizable returns. They, they Some of these funds have incredible track records and that's makes sense. Some of these cases yields tens of millions, if not more, in returns for the plaintiff and the investors ultimately. So they're uh, you know the ROI and the alpha is there. I think the the final thing that I'm also I think pretty excited about in this case is that with law firms, I believe that no non-lawyer actually can own shares in a law firm. It's one of those weird little nuances that, that I think keeps it kind of inside the family there. So this is one of those opportunities to get economic exposure into the legal industry from a financial perspective that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get through equity in a law firm or something like that, which is another cool opportunity that security tokens provide in terms of bringing new opportunities to the table. Absolutely love it, Kyle. I think that about covers it for litigation finance with security tokens there. If you enjoyed that, please check out the rest of the show in the past. We do the show every week on Mondays. And you can catch up a whole lot more of industry news on stomarket.com as well as on our blog, uh, as well as our What's Drippin' newsletter, which you can check all of that out again at stomarket.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll talk to you next week. Happy tokenizing. <laughs>